we have been in a series uh, for the last few weeks called It's Fine. And mm-hmm. Justin has been taking us um, on a journey and just exploring some things about how our emotions need our attention and how mm-hmm. a lot of times we ignore our emotions um, when we're in the moment of things and when things are happening to us. Mm-hmm. So um, we just thought it would be a good idea to talk with you about this last subject matter of where we're, what he just spoke about. Um, so we're going to dive a little bit deeper into okay. it. And I know who you are, but you might want to introduce yourself to everybody else who's not watching. So you are <laughs> Sharon Spaga. Um, I'm a marriage and family therapist in private practice. But I think part of the background that you're looking for today is I'm also widowed. Um, it's been about five years. Um, so I'm kind of a mom doing the grind like everybody else with a kid still yeah. at home. He was 11 when dad passed away. Um, my oldest was already married and uh, living in El Paso. And it was, uh, well, honestly, one night I, a sound woke me up out of a dead sleep and I flipped over. I remember flipping over to turn a light on and my husband had passed. He had had a heart attack. And while I'm not medically trained, I have enough training that I recognize he wasn't there. And I kind of assumed a heart attack. And um, part of what was really tough about that is I was also then, because of that, we lived out in the county, so I was first responder. Oh, my goodness. So, um, and I remember getting up and thinking, we can't, don't wake Caleb up, don't wake Caleb up, he can't see this grabbing a phone, calling 911, flipping on every light in the house, every light I could find outside the house, unlocking the doors, closing Caleb's bedroom door, and then running back to start CPR. And because we were out in county, um, I think it was about 20 minutes when I looked later at the phone before help even came. Um, I, It was what it was. Um, it took them another 20 plus minutes of CPR, and right as one of the People came out to tell me we we're going to call it. Somebody yelled from the bedroom, we've got a heartbeat. Um, we got to the hospital. I found out later he had coded in the ambulance again. Anyway, um, we had him in ICU. Nothing, nothing was keeping him alive but a plug in a wall. And they checked and looked at brain and heart, and there were I think he had 10% of his heart left. It was just, it was horrible. A lot of people, a lot of support there. But that was kind of the rundown of how that experience went down. So here's my 11-year-old at home who still doesn't know, and I've got an uncle and a friend over there with him. He wakes up, and so as you can imagine, part of this context is we're now sitting with, I've gone through this. I've got to tell my kids, I'd already called my oldest son and he was on his way, and I've got to tell my 11-year-old what happened. And life support, I want to say, there's some things that, you know, you're in, I was in shock a lot, but I want to say about three days, and it was just very clear from the tests where this was at. And so here's my little boy who kind of has a storybook childhood up to this point, the youngest, and wakes up one day and just doesn't have a dad anymore. So there's our context, (laughs) a little bit of it. So what we're talking about is loss and Mm -hmm. the emotions that come with uh, unexpected loss, obviously. I Mm -hmm. mean, that's the easiest thing to say about that. But um, And a sudden loss and how I can't even imagine um, where your mind must have went and the, the pile of emotion that was... Yeah, handed to you, kind of dumped on you a little bit. Um, I know that in the last sermon, Justin was talking about um, learning how to feel your emotions and how to express them. Mm -hmm. Imagine you had no idea at the moment of how to do that, um, about how you need to even slow down for a second to, to deal with the loss. Mm-hmm. Because of the suddenness of it, I don't. Mm-hmm. I don't. How do you do that? Um, I can't even begin to put into words what you must have been. I, I'll be honest and say, while I want to be able to express it in a way that's meaningful for other people today, I, I don't know how, that I can do it justice either. Right. 
I think there's a lot of mythology out there about grief. We quote a lot of old research from my field that was really about people grappling with being diagnosed with terminal illness. Mm. And so, you know, everybody's like, oh, are you experiencing the stages? <laughs> I just sit there and think. Stages of loss, stages, stages of, of grief. grief. And right. I'm like, what stages? Boy, that would be a lot easier. You know, pick your elevator mm-hmm. today, right? But the truth is, it's a tsunami. It's just all at once, it's a tsunami. And when you start kind of coming out of the shock of what's happened, it just washes over you, yeah. like King David writes about in the Psalms. And there is nothing that will stop it. There's nothing you can do to control it. And you can't fix it. Right. You know, I, I've said before, you and I have talked about fix is the F word for control. And it's fine is another one of my F words. It's junk. It's a way we... Um, dance around the struggle, dance around the hurt, dance around the isolation, the grief, and being completely overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm working in mental health. I know I've got to go back, and I know for every client I've got, which was 30-something at the time, wow. they know why I'm out, and I know I've got to process through this with them because it's triggering their stuff, which is kind of a little mm-hmm. bit like what we're going to maybe mm-hmm. talk about today. And they need to process, they need to express their concern for me. And so I went back in two weeks because I realized I've got to deal with this. I can't take a month or two off. I don't know if I could have done that financially anyway, but then I've still got to go back and this is going to hit. So you didn't, you, you, you didn't look at it. You not even thought that you you could ignore this. Like no, most people, no, no, no. Most people will push their feelings aside, especially with no. loss because of the overwhelmingness of it. Um, you can't. No. Well, okay. You can, clearly, in, in in a way, you can. On a surface level, you can. You can try. You can try to control it. You can try to fix it. Um, but the reality is, uh, we damage ourselves in that process. Mm-hmm. And I can remember thinking, uh, having that aha moment of even in the shock initially of, if I don't deal with this the right way, it's going to damage me. And it's going to damage me irreversibly, which will damage, it's already going to damage my kids, but I don't want to be another layer unwittingly. If I can help it of damaging them, it's going to damage my clients. So I'm sitting in the middle of this going, I don't want to sit here and be the client three years later saying, being diagnosed with PTSD because I wouldn't deal with my junk. Wow. So you, you, you had the wherewithal to even recognize that. Do you think that was kind of the Holy Spirit kind of? Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. You, you can't be in that kind of, um, you can know everything you think you know, right? I can know everything I think I know as a mental health professional. But when you are the one in the storm, if you're in a tsunami in a rubber boat, are you thinking about what you know or are you trying to find a way to survive? Right. And what's the only voice that can actually speak through that storm? There is one. There is only one voice that can speak through that storm. So what did that look like for you? Because you obviously needed to be sure that you didn't just turn on that voice, but you were hearing it loudly. Because I can't imagine you being directed by anything else. I can't turn that voice on. I can't pretend. And I know, and I and I recognize that there are times we all wonder, is that really what I'm supposed to do? Mm-hmm. Um, is that really God speaking? Um, but I understand that. But that's not something I can make up or turn on because God is God. Right. I don't control God. Right. Um, and so when there is an absolute clarity, calm, clear, the voice doesn't have to be loud. In fact, I can't tell you I've ever experienced God's voice being loud in my world. It's usually this very still, clear, calm, absolute, convicting directive. That's how I experience it. Maybe when I was in my 20s, you yell at me a lot and I just wasn't listening. <laughs> I don't know. But, but I think that's what happens because the noise of everybody else, the noise of this world is what's so loud. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think God's going to compete with that. I think he's going to be that little needle that just shoots right into it with the truth. And so to me, there's, a, there's clarity in that. And I knew I had to deal with it. I had to embrace the mess that I was. 
um, sitting feeling like my life in, a, in one moment had blown up into a million pieces. I didn't even want to crawl around and pick up. I no longer recognized my life. And so grief um, is very isolating in that respect because you everything that was normal is not normal anymore. Nothing's the same. Um, I can't speak to, to a loss of a child. That's I've not been through that. I've had a miscarriage, but I've not lost a child. I can tell you losing a spouse that there is not one corner of your life that doesn't impact. It changes everything about your life in a second. Mm-hmm. Everything you recognize about your life is done. It's gone. It's changed. Wow. So what do you do with that? And I just came to... This is going to sound really simplistic, but I could lean away from God and blame him for something that was not of him, in my opinion, or I could lean in and trust him. And so to me, the only option was, here's the mess. You knew it was coming, Lord. So um, I'm assuming you have a plan because I don't. And I think he finally went, hey, guys, she finally gets it a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, So the luxury... This is this probably strange word to use, the luxury of grief and embracing it and not hiding from it is I have learned so, so, so much that I would not trade. And it has made my relationship with God so intimate that the walk without him no longer feels like a legit option. Wow. I, I don't know a better way to say it than that. You learn to trust him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, here I am. I'm working in mental health. So I'm definitely ticked off about that at first, right? Because <laughs> I'm like, well, that's not fair. I got a little bit of special snowflake syndrome, <laughs> right? And then I had a little bit of special snowflake syndrome around. I, I came out of a home as a child. I came out of abuse, neglect. Um, like a lot of people listening to this, I'm sure can connect with that statement. And I don't want to spend time there other than to say I had been through so much. And I've had so much loss in my life already. Um, probably before I lost my husband, I had experienced, I want to say, five to seven deaths of close, you know, friends and family. Um, And so my special snowflake syndrome a little bit was, well, I've had my share. (laughs) And I think a lot of us think that way. We don't admit it out loud, but we're like, well, if you knew the story of my life, like we get some exemption from sin Uh and living in a fallen world. Mm -hmm. And so here comes a tsunami that is, worse than all the rest of it before together and just mows my life over. I can't lie to myself. I can't pretend. And so that actually is the blessing of it. If you allow it to be, it will bring you to your knees. It will take you all the way down. That takes some bravery. That takes some, you don't think so? Nope. I do not, I, and that's what I want. <laughs> I feel like you set me up on that one a no. little bit. Because I think we, no, it takes trust. Yes. It just takes. I did know where you were going to go with that. Because <laughs> we've talked, no, but I think it's important This for idea to we hear. talk about in our culture of bravery and being optimistic and. Right. I'm sorry. That's like polishing a turd. <laughs> that's, can I say crap on this? That's junk. Yeah. It's just junk. It's it's the stuff we do. And like we are not, you know, sometimes it's, I'm going to label something in, in the body. I think sometimes we run around saying, it's fine. Um, one of my big ones, when I you're talking to somebody and you know they're in pain, they're like, I'm just so blessed. And I'm like, you're about to keel over. Yeah. You're, you're about to lose it. Mm-hmm. What has happened that we think we worship a God who were created in his image he experiences and expresses all these emotions, and then we're experiencing them, but we refuse to express them. And, and we do this because that's weak. Well, we are weak. We're human. We're human. Yeah. We are weak, but for the grace of God go I. So mm-hmm. what is wrong with that? So then if I run around and I'm like, Lisa, I'm fine, and you're like, I'm blessed, it never gets real. We never connect. If you can imagine a walking down the block of your street, right, mm-hmm. where your house is, imagine if every sign above every door says, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, and you're walking down the road, and maybe even you are so overwhelmed by your life in a moment 
you're considering checking out of it. Mm -hmm. You're hurting, you're in pain, you feel lonely, but every house says, I'm fine. Whose door do you knock on? That's good. We have nowhere to call. Mm -hmm. So if we're all pretending, then we can't support each other. We literally can't function as the body but in a healthy way, the way we're designed to function. And, and I will be all ignoring. And yes, it's fine. It's yeah. fine. I'm blessed. Oh, sorry. And we are blessed. I'm not. I'm not taking away. In fact, one of my pet peeves, the way we, a lot of people talk about 2020, is like, oh, thank God that's over. Well, you know what? 2020 was. It was a. It might have been a darker canvas, but it highlighted every beautiful thing that happened yes. that much more for it. It created contrast. So there are blessings. But being blessed doesn't mean we turn off feelings. You can't just dial yourself out and be okay. Feelings aren't little buttons and you push the ones you want to feel and you get rid of the ones you don't like. It's one big knob. (laughs) And you are dialed in or you are dialed out. And it's really that simple. And I don't want to be dialed out because dialed out leads to depression, chronic anxiety. What, what, What would you say to encourage people? You've been through this. You've experienced this. You've felt it. You've breathed it. What 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 clicked for you? What 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 steps did you take? And I know everybody's everybody's experience is different, and I know that. It was just the simple. And it's probably not the answer you're expecting. Telling the truth. Confess because we don't confess for His sake. He's God. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. So what's the purpose of confession? What's the pur- What is confession? Because mm-hmm. we think confession, I think, means I run around and figure out where I was a naughty girl, and then I tell God about it so I can be a good Christian, which does not it exist. It has to do with, with what you've done wrong, is what we think confession is. Right. When it can be something totally Feelings, different. Feelings, thoughts, yeah. struggles, the need. real deal, the when stuff you you're need. afraid to say oh. out loud to your best friend. Mm-hmm. Well, your best human friend. <laughs> so how do you, so if a God, relationship with God is intimate, okay, and it's relational, or what's kind of the point, really? Because even the demons know who he is. Exactly. And Satan knows yep. Jesus is the son of God. Mm-hmm. So we have to get out of here. It's got to get past acknowledgement to something deep. And and when it's down here, it affects our lives. It affects, so that's relational. Right. I can't have a conversation with somebody that I don't talk to. Yep. <laughs> you know his voice. You need to be able to know his voice. You need to be able to, to recognize. Yeah. yeah. You know, that, that's so funny because when I called, so the accident I got in this morning on the way here, yes, ma'am. I call you to say, I'll be there, but I'm going to be a little late and I get Steve. And it's immediately discordant because of the closeness of our relationship and my brain goes, that's not her. Mm-hmm. I know the voice just like I knew his voice because of the relationship the three of us have. If you don't know the voice of the Father, because you don't have that relationship with him, start telling him the truth. Quit pretending you're fine. That's good. <laughs> so confession, again, isn't it's because something's sake. wrong. It's for our sake, exactly. It's yeah, and it's for the it. sake of the body. So if I come to you and confess and say, I think I have wronged you, it's for our sake. It's relational. But in, it the, in, the like, in the like manner, when you come and say, hey, I need someone to talk to. I need someone to pray with. You're confessing also that you're in need. And I think that's what we need to understand. It's okay to be in need. It's okay not to be fine. Because we have a father who is capable and willing and wanting to make things good for us. It's not what we know. It's who he is. Exactly. And so I think that one of the linchpins is saying who he is is one thing. We say it. we, We acknowledge it. But do we know who he is? And what, not being willing to walk through the grief. Grief is an outward expression of you know our feelings. It's outward expression mm-hmm. of inner pain, mm-hmm. and it's it's a, a vehicle to heal. Right. That's good. <clears throat> so if we avoid it, we don't even give ourselves the opportunity to heal. That's good. Right. So you have to do the work. I, I'm gonna say that to to people. You have to do the work. There's no quick answer. There's no quick resolution. You have to walk through it. And so who do you want to walk through it with? That's what it came down to for me. Mm -hmm. Who do I want to walk through this with? Because I have people. You're one of my people now. 
but we're fallible. We're going to fail each other. Yeah. And do I want to hold failure against somebody I love because they're human too? And do I want them to hold that against me? Or do I walk through trusting who God will place in my life when he does? Because I think he and Steve are two of those people that he intentionally planted <laughs> at the right time in my life. See, we're trying to trust each other, and then we're angry when people can't live up to being God. Mm. But if I trust God, whether I understand who steps in when, or for how long, or for what purpose, it doesn't matter. I'm not trusting. I'm letting them love me, and I'm trusting Him. I think that's one of the reasons why people are afraid to engage, too, because they're afraid they're going to let that person down. But when you come into a relationship Mm -hmm. with freedom to be who you are and freedom to be honest... Mm-hmm. I, I think from the get-go, our relationship has been like that. Yeah. Um, we, we're honest with each other about time frame, about what we can offer, what we can bring. But your expectation isn't on me. Your expectation no, is on the on Lord. Him. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So then that opens up for us to be able to be honest with each other and open with each other and say, yeah, I'm not fine today. I'm not fine today. I need someone to talk to, but I'm still going to go to my father who yes. has, my, who has my, my, my answers for me. God was up ahead of me in my life before I ever knew I would even have a husband. And this man was a true love in my life. I never thought I would marry, so an absolute gift. Um, came into our lives unexpected, unexpectedly for me. And I had 15 years I wouldn't trade for anything with him. But it's five years later, and I still have a purpose here. And he is not part of this anymore. Mm -hmm. And so how do I heal to get to this today if I'm fine? If all I'm doing is pretending, you know, polishing turds. (laughs) Right? So I just, I want to end on that. Okay. Okay. Simply because you're leaving, it. That's no, how we you're, leaving it, you're leaving it with God. You're saying he was that ahead does. of me. He knew. He knew. He knew what I would need. He was ready to provide it. The most profound thing I learned to pray, and, and this will be uncomfortable perhaps for some, is, well, you knew this was going to happen. Let me know how you're going to fix it, Lord. Mm. And I would kind of mentally, you know, dust the, the dust. Yeah. Brush off the dust on the bottom of my feet and keep moving forward. And I just, there were things I literally couldn't do and just had to trust. He's got an answer. He'll let me know. He'll reveal it in his time. But right now, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And you're not fine, but he's going to reveal it in his time. I don't have to be fine. Amen. (laughs) I don't need to be. I've got God. Why do we need to be fine when we have the living God who is concerned about every facet, every minute, every moment of our lives, what was, what is to come, and what is right now? Why do I need to be fine? It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to be the mess that we are. 